super excited to be here to talk about this topic today. I think we've seen super consistently that anything error monitoring related um, on our blog tends to be really well trafficked. Um, and Pascal has been doing some really interesting work on this topic for several years now. So he is a really good resource and knows a lot about this. Um, just to, before we get started, the event is sponsored by LogRocket, and we do have an exclusive offer for those of you on the call today. Um, anyone who attends a personalized demo following the webinar is going to be entered into a drawing for a free Nintendo Switch. And typically there's only like maybe five people who qualify for this, so the odds are in your favor. Just keep that in mind. We'll send out some links via email after in case anyone is interested. And then, oh, I skipped a slide. Super quick introduction to LogRocket before I hand it over to Pascal. Um, our mission is to help software teams build better digital experiences. And the way that we do that is by combining these three product categories into an all-in-one front-end monitoring and session replay solution. So session replay is the idea of replaying user experiences um, through DOM recording, super helpful for troubleshooting issues. Um, we also have an analytics product that can be useful for more PM teams who are interested in optimizing product metrics. And then this idea of issues, which is just the idea of surfacing exceptions, technical errors, and some other non-technical errors that you might not know that users are experiencing in your products. Um, so that's it. I will shut up for now and hand it over to Pascal. Awesome. Thank you, Will. All right, let me get the screen share back online. So first, thank you everyone for, for attending. Um, I'm Pascal, I'm the VP of Engineering here at LogRocket. Been here for past six and a half years or so. Um, and in that time have probably seen most of the problems that can go wrong in a front end. We have ourselves a pretty complicated application. Um, at this point, I don't get to write too much code anymore, um, but I think we've, we've found some really nice ways of dealing with errors over time that, that I'd love to share with you today. So to that end, to start, I wanted to talk a little bit about the problem. Um, you know, what has changed about engineering or has anything changed about engineering? Um, you know, why, is that, why is it more difficult now to monitor applications? Um, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you might do this in a React app. Um, we've gotten a lot of traction on our blog for how you do React error monitoring. I'm gonna talk about why this sort of always falls into the same um, patterns as, as doing error monitoring anywhere else. Uh, and then we're going to talk a lot about what else exists outside of exceptions. Um, and then lastly, we're going to look at how LogRocket solves this problem um, with uh, our new ML product. So let's start with what has changed. So over the last I don't know, five to 10 years, there's been this kind of increasing complexity in, in front-end architectures and back-end architectures. Um, you know, things are no longer coming from one server. They're sitting on a CDN and talking to microservices and it's a micro front-end and there's state all over the place. Um, and when an exception gets thrown or an error happens, it can happen anywhere across that stack. Uh, and it can happen you know, at any time to a user who maybe isn't even online. And so users on the other hand have become pretty picky. Um, we now look for the sort of perfect user experiences that we get from you know, larger companies. Um, sort of gone are the days where something like a, a bank or an insurance company can have uh, a UI that looks more dated. Everyone needs a larger front end. Um, Pascal, sorry to interrupt. I think yeah. um, you might have paused the slides. It's still showing your uh, headshot. Huh. There it is. Okay, sorry about that. All right, and then lastly, all of these kind of increasingly complex architectures lead to more noise, and we'll talk more about noise. And that's really a lot of the theme of this talk is how do we reduce this noise? Um, but before that, let's talk a little bit about how this used to work. Um, on the back end, you would have the sort of try catch pattern, it still works this way on the back end, um, and you would capture your exceptions and maybe log them to some sort of error monitoring tool. 
and that all works pretty well. On the front end, on the other hand, we tend to run into this case where we capture an exception and then we actually need to show something to this user. Um, we can't just go, oh, this failed, tough luck, this is a product problem. Um, it's still an engineering problem. And it can be really difficult to build UIs around this because errors can be very local. Um, so to give you an example of how you might do this in um, React, you might try to return an error object here. Um, it turns out this doesn't work. This doesn't work if we're doing any sort of asynchronous work. Um, and React is also really fussy about catching things in any sort of subcomponents. So if something else in this component breaks, it's still going to break your entire component. People have found some really creative ways around this. Um, the one that we probably see the most are hooks. Um, and you can sort of create a hook that um, contains your error state. And then you can do any sort of asynchronous work um, in, a, in an effect hook, and you can still render your error. You can check if you have an error. Um, it ends up being fairly bespoke, but one really nice thing here is that you can create um, these hooks that don't include any try-catch logic, or at least not to the end user. So you can take this whole piece of code and you can abstract it into your own component um, or your own hook. You can use that hook. And now as a consumer of that API, I can just consume an error. And that's a lot nicer than trying to consume an exception. Um, but still doing these one-offs leads to sort of less intentional designs a lot of the times. Users don't know what to do when you just say, hey, the, an error happened. Um, and I think we've all seen this. And it also only covers known errors. It doesn't work for any sort of unexpected errors that, that you might have. And so React solves this with error boundaries. And error boundaries are really just a big catch um, somewhere in your hierarchy. Um, but we actually really like these at LogRocket because they let you not worry about the sort of local errors. Um, they work for unexpected errors. They're composable, they're robust, and they force you into being a little bit more intentional with your error design because they can be much larger on the page. Um, so I wanted to show you a few examples of those. Um, and here's a screenshot of one in our, in our app where a, a session failed to load. And I'm going to use examples from our app exclusively we all have errors, that's part of the fun. Pascal, we have a, an interesting question in the chat. Um, yeah, go for it. So the examples we're looking at are React. Will anything mm -hmm. you are sharing change if we were using Angular or Vue or some other front-end framework? Not at all. React is the one that we get the most traction on on our blog, so that's the where it shows the examples. Um, from here on out, there'll be no more uh, sort of specific examples we're going to look at examples of mostly non-technical errors going forward. Um, but I expect that in Angular or Vue, you can also have these sort of broader catch statements. Um, and so the way this looks in, in practice is we can uh, hop over into LogRocket. And here we have um, a chart of all of the error boundaries that were hit in React. Um, and I can kind of drill into you know, any single one of them, I'm just going to make a point. And my colleague Joe here is, in this case, giving a demo to a customer. And once this loads, he, he leaves. And at some point, oh, it breaks. Um, this is obviously not a great experience. And I think this is where we could have been more intentional with design. Um, you know, this is kind of a common problem with error states. So maybe that should have a retry button or something else. Um, but one of the things LogRocket lets you do is, is quantify how often these happen. Um, because without that, you, you're kind of stuck. And so this isn't happening very much. If it happens once or twice a week, I think we're, we're sort of in okay shape and we don't need to do a lot of work there. So a big problem with just try catches is that issues aren't really just exceptions. It's not just that something is technically broken. Um, it can be all sorts of things. So it can be UX issues, something like the button is off screen or it's too small and it can't be clicked. 
Um, users are pretty quickly confused when, when you add strangers. Um, and then of course there are performance issues, both backend and front end that have an impact on the user that might not throw exceptions. So let's start with performance real quick. And I'm gonna talk through how, how LogRocket kind of helps you manage performance errors um, and what kind of errors you might wanna look at. I think the first one, maybe even the first two are pretty obvious, something like API duration. You wanna know how quickly your API responds. Um, users get frustrated pretty quickly. And then Web Vitals are Google's take on low time performance and page performance, um, which I think at this point have kind of spread through the industry. Everyone is looking at those metrics. Where it gets a little bit more interesting to us is this idea of time between events. Um, having custom, sort of meaningful, business relevant metrics really helps you define what success looks like for a given page. And I'll have some examples of that. So I'm going to hop over to a, a dashboard that we use internally, or a similar dashboard to what we use internally, um, where we treat track performance. So things like you know, network request percentiles, um, just timing. And again, we can click into these and, and see sessions and examples of when users encounter a slow request. Um, and that really helps build empathy. Uh, seeing uh, you know, 2.2 on this list, you think, oh, it sounds okay. And then you watch the session and it's, it's just gratingly slow. Um, then down here, we have some time between events ones. So key interactions, something like you click the play button and then playing started. Um, that's a key interaction for us. And that's very different from opening the session. Um, there's a, you know, you're already in the app, you don't want to wait a long time. This is sort of the closest analog we have to the low time of a session. Um, and nothing else really compares. Network requests, then you miss out on all the performance on the front end. And if you just look at front end performance, then you miss out on all of the network interactivity. Um, and then we also track things like error boundaries over time. Um, Error boundaries bring us to sort of a second set of, of errors, which would be uh, you know, kind of the UX errors. So that's things like rage clicks, dead clicks, frustrating requests, which I'll, which I'll demo, and then also error states. So when an error boundary is hit, you're probably gonna show an error. And in LogRocket, you can actually define that as an error state. Um, so, Let's start with rage clicks. And I'm just gonna try to find one here. All right, so here's my colleague Harrison giving a demo and I expect it's not gonna go super well. Give that a hot second to load, that's a big session. All right, so he's going, he's trying to edit this, he's clicking, he's clicking, he's clicking some more, and it just didn't work. You can't actually click that pencil, but you couldn't at the time. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that just an exception is not going to tell you. And you can watch just oodles and oodles of sessions before you find the sort of error without having some sort of filter for it. Another case would be a, a frustrating network request. Let's see, here's Harrison again. He's showing off a funnel and this thing just spins. It spins and it spins and there it is. Um, not a great look on a demo, the kind of thing we definitely wanna know about. And as an end user, just a frustrating experience. Pascal, another question. Yeah. What's the definition of a frustrating request? So that's interesting. Um, it's not just time-based. Um, what we found is that if you just look at time-based requests, there's too much noise in the, in the output. It can be your analytics tool sending data for two seconds. That's not probably not gonna have any impact on the user. Um, so we look for requests that are slow-ish and also have some indication of the user waiting. So you can see in this time frame, Harrison didn't do very much. Um, the other thing that we'll sometimes see is users will kind of follow the loading spinner with their mouse. So they'll just sort of scroll up and down. Um, and so we have a, a little data science model that detects whether someone is potentially waiting or not, and will only flag the ones where they are waiting. It's a good question. All right. And then lastly, to briefly cover error states, I'm going to expand the sidebar a little bit here. 
what you can do in LogRocket is you can create, we call a definition. And you can say there's some element that's visible either based on text or on you know an ID. Maybe you have sort of error, more likely to be a class, I guess. Um, you can call that you know, error, error visible. And you can use it as an error state. And if you use it as an error state, we will show it as an, as an issue. So you can hop into issues. Um, you can look at just error states. They're not set up in this particular demo project. Um, and it'll, it'll show you all of the times that users have encountered these error states. All right. You might say we've just added a bunch of noise to the problem, and you'd be right. Um, we now have half a dozen more things that we want to track, uh, you know, error states, slow performance, rage clicks. We already sort of started with the premise that exceptions are a little bit noisy, and they are. Um, and to make matters worse, a lot of third parties are going to add to that noise. Um, your analytics tool is going to start throwing exceptions, and what we found is that most other error tracking tools think that doesn't matter, um, but we'll actually see an example of where it does. So we think the real cause of the noise or the, the reason the noise is so hard to cut through is that there's no way to connect any of the errors to user impact. And, and when you think about noise, we call it noise because it doesn't matter. And when it doesn't matter, it just doesn't have an impact on the user. And so what we've spent the last few years building has been a system that can create that connection to user impact. And so we call that Galileo. And so back to this screen, um, I've already triaged them here, but we have this little toggle um, that will show us all of our issues. Let me try to expand this just a little bit. Oh, this is why. And I triaged a few ahead of time. If, if my internet likes streaming video and fetching data. I think you might be experiencing a frustrating request right now, Pascal. I, I'm going I'm to signal that to the, to the model here. Yeah, quite a frustrating request, actually. It's the downside of using doing demos live. All right. Okay, these are a little hard to read, so I'm going to give myself a little bit more space. Um, so you can see these bars here is kind of rated by severity. Um, and I want to look at two of these errors just to show you the kind of things that, that the, the model brings up. So the first one here, too many re-renders. Um, this is kind of a classic exception that if you saw that in your error monitoring logs, you would almost certainly go and look at. Um, the way this manifests is something like this. So this is our homepage, and it's dead. Um, that is not a bug. The user then refreshes, and it's dead again. And obviously, we don't we don't want that. Um, so that got fixed pretty quickly, and that's a sort of high severity issue, and it indicates that there's quite a bit of user frustration here. Um, the other one we want to look at is this analytics is not defined. And this is interesting because this is a third party tool causing trouble. Um, and I happen to know that the second one is an interesting example of it. This user is reading our blog, reading our blog. And actually they click on something. And then they get horribly stuck in whatever this, this model is supposed to be showing. Um, and the reason they're stuck is that there's an analytics call that's supposed to happen when you close this model. Um, and I assume they had an ad blocker or something of the sort, and they actually blocked that call. Um, so it didn't fire. And the way this system works is that we're not actually classifying the errors themselves. We're classifying how the user responds to the error. Um, and that means we can do this in sort of a privacy preserving way as well. When you triage issues, you help train our model and we look at 
sort of aggregate user behavior after the exception, but we don't look at things like the text on the page or um, the text in the errors or in your logs or anything of that sort. We look at things like, hey, you're kind of moving your mouse kind of funny. You keep retrying the same actions. Um, and so over time, this should continue to get better. And it will also start to learn for your app specifically what kind of errors you care about um, and which ones you don't care about as much. And then lastly, um, you know, if you do set this up, you can then tell us to send you a, a sort of digest every month um, or every week, and we'll send you your list of sort of most important issues straight to Slack. You can come in, you can triage them, and you can hopefully start to cut through the noise quite a bit. All right. I'll pause there. Any questions about that? We have a question from David. How's the performance overhead for the session recording feature? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we try to keep it minimal. I'm sure the sales answer is none. It's not quite true. Um, but all of the heavy lifting gets done in a worker thread. Uh, and we have a little monitoring loop that looks at CPU, memory, and network performance and decides if we should continue to record as normal, if we should throttle, or worst case, we'll, we'll turn it off. So we don't prioritize ourselves over your app. Um, we should never be blocking the main thread more than a couple of milliseconds. Um, and if you see anything beyond that, uh, please let us know. Fantastic. Another question, Pascal, if the contents of the page are sensitive, what options do we have to avoid recording them? Yeah, good question. So um, you can tell us not to record certain parts of the page. So in the case of, of web recordings, if you have a DOM element that's private, you can add a little data tag on there that tells us that it's private. We will strip it um, client side. We'll just record the size. Um, and then at playback, we'll just show a bunch of gray boxes where it used to be. We won't record any clicks on it, any interactions with it. Um, if you have private data in something like network or logs or somewhere else, um, you can give us a, a function that sanitizes that data. So basically, we will record a network request. Um, we will pass it through your function, and then whatever comes out the other side is what we'll actually send. Um, so you might drop the body or you might drop an authorization header or something like that. Another one. Um, oh, this is a good one. Are the bounds for alerts adjustable? As an example, the powers on high have decided that a two second network response is acceptable, but four seconds is not. Can we avoid alerts for the two second request? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's two answers to this, I think. If you have a performance sort of chart where you're looking at network request duration like this, um, you can add a custom alert here that has, you know, kind of all of the options you would expect. So you can pick which percentile, um, you can alert over a certain time period and um, over a certain duration. And you can do that to email, Slack, webhooks, um, we'll even trigger a pager duty alert for you. In the case of something like Galileo, it, currently it decides whether it thinks that an issue is problematic or not, and that's purely based on how the user responds. Um, so, you know, I think there's a future world where in apps that are always just a little bit slow and maybe have a second or two of delay, um, we'll start to look for anomalies in that. Currently, we'll look for anomalies from kind of the broader set of apps. I'd imagine, too, that probably not all APIs are created equally, but you're, you're the okay. expert here, so I don't know. Yeah, that is correct. Um, you know, if there's if there's something you can't alert on and, and you would like to, please let us know. I think alerting is a really interesting use case of all of this kind of front end data um, that we have access to here. All right. I think 
One more thing to show would be just some basic setup. So if you've never used LogRocket, um, it really is as simple as just dropping a script tag on your page um, and we'll start to record from, from there. And then, you know, please look at our documentation for, for cleaning up sort of sensitive data as well. Awesome. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the chat? Oh, a question. Do we support integration with open telemetry? We do not at the moment. Um, do you have something specific that you'd like to integrate with there? Any any um, elaboration on that, David? He says not really, just curious. Okay. Well, yeah, if you if you come up with a like really strong, strong use case, please reach out and let us know. Um, I think it's an interesting, interesting direction to, to take the product in. All right. I think we're officially out of questions. Any last questions? I'll stop sharing my screen. Cool. I think that'll probably do it then, unless there are any last minute questions here. Um, so thanks so much to Pascal. Thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, don't forget, we are uh, raffling off a free Nintendo Switch. Anyone who's here today who sees a demo of LogRocket after the webinar it will be entered, and your odds probably won't be too bad. Um, so keep that in mind. And thanks again, everyone. See you guys.